much. I'm the head of the Department of Political Science here at the University of Regina, and it's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Before I do, I want to thank the sponsors of tonight's lecture, the Center for the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, and especially Simon Enoch for his work in making the arrangements to bring uh, Professor Page here tonight. The Faculty of Arts at the University of Regina, and <coughs> the Departments of Sociology and Political Science, and indeed the School of Journalism. Uh, and Kevin met with some very eager and interesting journalism students this morning. The Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, the Faculty of Business Administration, the University of Regina Faculty Association, the Public Service Alliance of Canada's Women's Committee, and the Saskatchewan Uni Union of Nurses. The diversity of that list of sponsors speaks really to the esteem with which Professor Page is held and the eagerness for Canadians to want to hear what he has to say about our institutions of government and governance, and by extension, what that means for our democratic practices as a nation. Currently, Kevin Page is the Jean-Luc Pepin Research Chair in Political Studies in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Ottawa. <coughs> Prior to becoming an academic, Professor Page worked for 27 years in the federal public service, mostly in central agencies responsible for budgeting, including the Department of Finance, Treasury Board Secretariat, and the Kirby Council Office. In 2008, he left his position as Assistant Secretary for Macroeconomic Policy at PCO to become Canada's first parliamentary budget officer, a position he held until earlier this year. And it was during that time as parliamentary budget officer that Professor Page became known to Canadians. His office is penchant for insisting on its independence, as any office of Parliament should, and for publishing analysis that at times contradicted the, the analysis issued by the government, made headlines, and, more on one, and on more than one occasion put the government on the defensive. And I was thinking while the government may have been on the defensive with some, it also tended to be on the offense when it came to its relationship with Mr. Page. Like the Office of the Auditor General, the Parliamentary Budget Office quickly became an important and vital element in Canadians' push for greater levels of transparency and accountability from its government. And it's fair to say that Kevin Page epitomizes the view that the true role of the public servant is to speak truth to power, even when that truth is not what the powerful want to hear. And we're incredibly fortunate tonight that Professor Page is going to speak his truth to us. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Page. tougher questions than the House Finance Committee. Um, it was a good thing that Mr. 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 Goodell wasn't at that committee when I was there, so it would have been even tougher. <laughs> um, yeah, just a great day. And then, you know, I got to listen to people from you know, Regina and talking about issues like the big referendum. You know, I was just reading the Prairie Dog and if, if, you know, to get the sense of, like, uh, of what was going on. I was, to be honest, inspired by the turnout. And just from the level of discussion, the civic engagement around that issue. And uh, what a great project that would have been for a budget office. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and not just that, I mean, other issues, people are just talking about just the matter of the course of conversation, the football stadium. I got to learn about the lean uh, system that's being used in the government and to try to find efficiencies. And uh, so, like a really nice day, and just spoiled with hospitality. I definitely put on two or three pounds. Uh, so thank you very much. It's just always the hospitality you get when you come to Saskatchewan, for sure, and it's famous for that. Just a, just a word, I want to thank, obviously, Simon and Cheryl for amazing hospitality, and the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. We need the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives in this country. We need, you know, I wish we had more, but thank God we have the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. 
and um, I know this is a, partly a fundraising drive as well for them. And I've, you know, I've been involved with them, you know, I've kind of had the opportunity to speak in Toronto and in Ottawa with the Centre and just the work that they do. And if you just, you know, I, and I just scanned through, I didn't see this publication, but, you know, the publication highlights some of their studies. And uh, I think the lean, the lean people should look at the studies that comes out of the, uh, you know, the, the, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives to see how part productive they are. But, you know, every, you know, every possible issue, like, you know, from power issues to, to, uh, to privatization of liquor issues to environmental issues, labor issues, you know, I understand they're working on a big project looking at the cost of living, you know, kind of a wage issue within respect to this area that has seen a lot of growth and higher house prices that cuts in on disposable income as well. So, like, you absolutely need that. And you know when you need it because you know, you know, and I know uh, Simon's been involved in writing opinion pieces for, you know, around this, this big issue, the referendum last night. And uh, you absolutely need that kind of analysis so that you just, you feel it, it helps civic, civic engagement. And I think that was a testimony. So a few months ago, Simon asked me to come and to say a few words. And so I said, Simon, what do we talk about? So we negotiated a title. And uh, so the title is The State of Canada's Prodigy Institutions, What It Means for Our Democracy and Prosperity, and kind of a view from me as the, as the Prodigy Budget Officer. And thank you, Tom, for those amazing remarks. You know, it's not, I'm not really quite used to being called a professor. <laughs> it still hasn't sunk in yet, but it's a great environment. A great environment to be in a learning environment. And actually, nice if you can get Parliament to be more of a learning environment. <laughs> but we're working on it. So, I, I guess I'd like to have a conversation of, you know, of these institutions, you know, the state of our Parliament institutions. Um, but I'd like to do it, I'd like to set it up a little bit. Just a, a few comments about what's going on. You know, this fall actually, what will likely go on uh, this fall with respect to the Senate, the speech on the throne, just a little bit of a setup, because that will influence, uh, it'll have an influence of political discussions over the next year to two years. And then talk a little bit about, just a few words about the economy and the fiscal situation, because that shapes, you know, uh, how, what our political leaders do and how they look at, you know, budget issues coming up. And then to finally to talk about institutions, if that's okay. And um, I have three kind of overarching messages. I find as I get older, it's really important to have no more than three. And I'll just say them at the beginning, because I'll probably lose track of it as I start speaking. So I mean, the first three overarching messages. One, I think for me, like the road to 2015, it's an election year coming up. And you know, it's very important to democracy. Elections are not the only, you know, not the most, they probably are as, as important as anything in a democracy, but you know, we have one in 2015. And for me, it starts this fall. I think it gets restarted. I think it's going to get restarted with the speech on the throne, and that we're going to see in just a few weeks' time, in the middle of October. And I think, to me, I think as a Canadian citizen now, as a professor, that gets to hang out with you know amazing students, like I did today here at the School of Journalism, um, the country needs that discussion about priorities and policy directions. That's you know that goes beyond the electoral cycle. But you know, this long term that inspires all of us to want to do things. And I think so we, I'm hoping we get the discussion. And I think at the same time, I think for you know opposition parties, I think you know, I think you know, we know I, I have a feeling that that, um, that the Prime Minister is gonna come out strong with a speech from the throne. I think you know I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I think he needs to do that. But I think you know, for the opposition parties, it's a time for them to shine too, I think, this fall. And I think they need to start to show their cards with respect to what are their policies and priorities are. Uh, I think it's an important time for the opposition parties as well. So again, number one message, I think the road to the 2015 election gets restarted right now in the fall of the speech on the throne. Number two, I think the government is on track to balance its books over the medium term, the fiscal balance issue, and they talked, the conservative government's talked a lot about that. I think we, you know, even with relatively weak growth, yeah, and a lot of uncertainty, I still think we're going to get the balance, and, and you know, that's a good thing, and I think, um, you know, but one, I don't think the problems is, and PBO actually released a report today, PBO, the Parenting Budget Office released a report, it's their fourth annual report on fiscal sustainability. So a little bit like actuaries, we look to the long term, and we look at the you know, fiscal structures you know, at the federal level, the provincial and, and municipal level, and then we look at the pension system, the Canada Pension Plan, the Quebec Pension Plan. And we know when PBO released the report today, basically what they're saying is that the federal government's actually in pretty good shape when you look at aging demographics, when you look at that fiscal structure, will it stabilize the size of our debt relative to the economy? So the federal government's in pretty good shape. And uh, provincially, though, we have a gap. 
you know, they estimate what that gap is, and they say that we would need to take actions about two percentage points of GDP, and our, our economy is about one point eight trillion dollars. So that'd be like eighteen billion dollars actions right across the provinces in order to kind of close that gap, to stabilize debt, because we're going to face this aging demographic issue. Um, you know, I love that quote from Woody Allen. He, Woody Allen says, um, "No, I won't go. I'll save it for later." <laughs> I'm going to say the Woody Allen quote for that. No, what Woody Allen is like, what do you think of aging? He says, I'm against it. <laughs> and what do you do? You can't do it. You know, if you're an economist and you look at demographics, it's a very important issue. And you look at your fiscal structures, you know there's going to be pressures on certain types of programs. And it has impacts for the economy, too. And healthcare is a very big issue. And it's a very big issue for provincial governments. And you know, a little while back, the Prime Minister, the Finance Minister decided that they were going to solve the problem by just cutting, reducing an escalator, the amount of money that they transferred to the provinces. So they took a lot of that fiscal burden and threw it onto the laps of the provinces, over the provinces to solve. But it doesn't really solve anything when you have that, that national conversation. So we need that. So number two, I think fiscally, though, we're in good shape at the federal level. Provinces, we've got work to do. That's not a massive gap two percentage points. We had bigger issues back in the 1990s, so we can close that gap. But you need to take actions. You can't just, uh, you can't avoid it. Number three message, I would say, the House of, Con the, the House of Commons, where I got to work uh, in support over the past five years, they, they lost control of the public purse. And I want to talk a little bit about what I mean that. And, you know, so we send members of parliament you know, to, um, to Ottawa, and then we don't give them the information that they need to do their jobs to hold the executive to account. And I think that's a big failure. And there's a lot of literature right now, I highlight some of it, that basically you know, it speaks to what that means for democracy and what that means for prosperity down the road. And I think, you know, the system is broken, and I have no troubles telling you why it's broken. I can tell you, just from my own experiences as the prime deep budget officer, what they got and what they didn't get, what we tried to give them, and, and the, the, the reaction we got from the government. And then what concerns me is we kind of pretend like this doesn't matter, you know, as, as citizens. And again, I'm kind of inspired by what went through what you had, what happened yesterday in the referendum here in Regina. And I think we need to have that kind of civic engagement across the country about you know, the importance of these institutions, because it does matter. And it's fair to say when we, we're losing trust, you know, I think in Parliament, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Senate. And that has implications for our democracy. And I think, you know, and I think we also know what it's like to lose confidence in fiscal management. And again, as I said, I think fiscally we're in pretty good shape. Um, but I think the lessons that we learned in the 1990s, and when, uh, when Mr. Gooda had to solve a big fiscal problem for us in, you know, in Ottawa, is that, you know, this, those seeds of the next fiscal crisis, they get planted early. And so one of the things, one of the reasons why they created a parliamentary budget office was to throw out flags when you saw issues that were coming down. You know, fighter planes that, you know, the government would say, we can get those on the cheap. And we say, no, you're not going to get them that cheap. You know, our crime bills, they say, you know, we can be tough on crime. It doesn't cost anything. I said, well, actually, it does cost things. If you put more people in prisons and you keep them there longer, there will be a cost. So you have to worry about like, planting those seeds for the fiscal crisis, the next fiscal crisis. And we, they do come. So just a few words in that context about the pl political context and challenges. As I said, I think the road to the next federal election starts in the fall with the tailing and the SFT. To me, the transition, or the challenge actually for Parliament is the transition, you know, from relative dysfunction in, you know, what you see for the most part when you watch, you, you watch news and read the newspapers about what's going on in the Senate and the House to relative function. So that's a challenge that parliamentarians all face, and uh, they're going to face it this fall. And I think, again, as I said, I think the challenge for the opposition parties now, while well, the federal government's going to put forth its speech on the throne, is they're going to have to present their vision. What is their vision for the, you know, for the economy? What's their vision for uh, social programs? What is their vision for the environment, uh, for, for the next generation of kids? And I think if they just oppose, uh, I think they're going to miss an important opportunity. So then the question becomes, like, who's going to occupy the high road in this debate over the fall? And first, again, moving forward to 2015. And my own feeling is that road is vacant right now. It's open territory and a huge opportunities for all parties. Okay, a few words on the Senate spending scandal. For me, the Senate is a trust issue, which I think in many cases, unfortunately, some very, you know, some unfortunate senators have lost the trust of Canadians. It's not a fiscally material issue in the Senate right now. And I think as all parliamentarians know, even the parliamentary budget officer knows, the governor of the Bank of Canada knows you need trust to lead. And once you lose it, you can't get it back. It's very hard to get it back. And, and there's a major price to that. 
And you cannot institutionalize trust. You can't just say, well, I'm part of this great institution called Parliament, so you've got to trust them. You know, I think you've got to earn that trust. And I think they've lost it. And I think also the Senate is a major policy distraction right now. It's going to drag, it has the potential to drag on. And I think that's, that's uh, going to be a major, a major issue. I think it's going to be a hard issue for public servants for providing policy direction in the next speech in the throne. But I think it's also going to be hard like, for the prime minister to table that speech in the throne and then keep the focus on, on you know, the next number of months leading up to the budget. I think, ironically though, I think it creates pressure on the prime minister to change the channel. And I thought that prorogation, and I'm somebody that worked at, you know, in, in Lajeman for a number of years, um, and the, you know, prorogation might have been a signal that the Prime Minister looked at his speech in the throne and he came back at the end of the summer and says, it's not good enough. You know, we need to strengthen it. This will not change the channel away from the Senate. Uh, robocalls calls or whatever the issue of the day is, you know, depending on the day. We need to have, we need to kind of start inspiring Canadians. So, again, then the question becomes how, the, how are the opposition parties going to respond in that kind of context? I don't think the Senate problem can be fixed from within. And I think we're going to need, we're going to need the AG, certainly the Auditor General, to help. And we might even need more than the Auditor General to help. And I think this, the long run issue of the Senate, I don't think it gets fixed between now and the election, but I think it needs to be debated. What kind of Senate do we want in this country? Uh, and I think that's a big election issue in 2015. But that debate could start, could start now if it doesn't get solved. But there's a nice quote that I like from this, you know, this novelist, uh, American novelist, Upton Sinclair. It kind of speaks to how these, you know, when you have these problems, how they get fixed. And he said 100 years ago, it is difficult to get a man, you could say a person, to understand something when, his, or when their salary depends on, on them not understanding it. <laughs> Very wise advice 100 years ago. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. So I don't think the Senate is going to fix the problem. These internal committees that are responsible for these sorts of issues, they're not going to solve it. So you know, the AG is going to come in and is going to you know, do a financial audit. It's going to find more problems. Trust is going to become a bigger issue. Um, but I think the solution is going to have to come from a bigger political discussion. Just a few words about political polling. And now that I'm no longer the Parliamentary Budget Office, I get to look at these things. And you know, in the context of, and also some upcoming by-elections. I you know, I know somebody, somebody like me that worked in the lodgement building with, you know, where the prime minister would have his office. That you know, I could you know, work one floor above the prime minister's office. It's something they're always interested in. Like I never totally understand it or appreciate it, but they're always very interested in polling. You know, average monthly polling numbers. How do they change? The little movements in them. And I think a lot of us, when we see what happens in various elections, we say like, are they even accurate? Uh, but nonetheless, they look at them. And I think when I look at those average monthly polling numbers, you know, since the last election, there's been a lot of change. And I think the numbers have shifted and they've actually tightened for a bit. And I think I know having worked in Washington, that gets people excited. That would get the government excited. They can start to feel a little bit of pressure. And, you know, I think the latest, uh, you know, the latest monthly numbers kind of show that if we were to have an election right now, there, there wouldn't be a majority government, there'd be a minority the conservatives would probably still squeak it out, but I think that would actually, you know, you know, and I can't say another prime minister personally, that would bother the prime minister. You know, after you had the chance of leading the majority to go back to the minority would be a very difficult thing. And then we also have these by-elections that are going to come up. There's four of them, and actually. There's two in Manitoba, one in Ontario, and Quebec, and they're going to be, you know, people are going to watch very carefully, like, you know, how do the, what signals do you get from those by-elections and politically? You know, all this said is that this creates pressure. I like pressure. You know, I think it, 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 this kind of pressure is it, going to hopefully lift these people up to respond in a better way. It's at least an opportunity for them to respond in a better way. And I think hopefully, you know, the opposition parties as well, they come back this fall with a speech on the throne, they debate priorities. And yeah, we need to fix the Senate, but it's not can't be the only issue facing, you know, Canadians for the next, you know, couple of years and longer. So this, I think the political stakes are rising. And so we need parties to put some cards on the table, I think this debate for the 2015 election starts now. Okay, a few words about the economy and the fiscal situation. I mean, for me, I think the challenge still for Minister Flaherty, I think, and, and I think for Cabinet, when they're looking at the budget, still a lot of international uncertainty, more than that they would like. Um, so not, you know, easy times. And, you know, I think, I think you know, the, the uncertainty is, is, is shifting, you know, and it's coming from different directions. But I think the challenge is also fiscal choice which it doesn't get debated a lot, thank you very much. You know, in, in Ottawa, or even you know, in, on these sort of national talk shows, there is fiscal choice. I think for the federal government, they made a choice. They said, we're gonna get back to balance over the medium term. 
and by medium term, it means usually over the next five years. So by 2015, 16, you know, they have a relatively small deficit now. You know, probably it'll probably 13, 14, probably less than 20 billion dollars. So about a percentage point of GDP. They're going to get that back to balance. And so, but the choice for them is like, do you keep that course? Now you have the speech on the throne, you have the Senate issues, like do you stay, we still want this, or do you, we still want to get back to balance, it's the most important thing for us, we don't want to go into the next election, we're still running deficits after the liberals had all those surpluses from the you know, late 1990s up until you know, 2007 and 8. You know, do we, do we want to move forward with some bold initiatives? And what would be the cost for those initiatives? And what would be those initiatives to strengthen the economy? <coughs> or deal with, uh, you know, some social challenges or deal with environmental issues. I think just on the economy, I think for me, I think the short-term, medium-term economic outlook for Canada is not, not going to change very much. So from those people in Langevin, the Prime Minister's office, writing a speech on the throne, they're saying, okay, what's the economic context? Is it shifting on us? It's not really shifted. Like, the overall numbers are going to stay the same. I think like, for Canada, you know, this you know, means kind of sluggish growth. The growth would probably be more in the 2% range for this year, next year, maybe getting a little bit stronger. And that's actually, you know, we would have, I'm sure, given that the economy is still operating below potential, they would like something much higher, or much higher than that, and they're not getting it. Without that growth, without higher growth, you don't get the progress in terms of reducing that unemployment rate. And if you're going into the next election and you have an unemployment of 7%, that's not necessarily so good when you came in and, and the unemployment was, rate was less than 6%. I think, you know, unfortunately, maybe I'm sure the Prime Minister thinks about this from time to time, that he hasn't been so lucky. And it's, you know, it's hard for me to be sympathetic to the Prime Minister, but he hasn't been so lucky. And it's just like, you know, since, uh, certainly at least since 2008, it's been one crisis. Yeah, you know, effectively one big crisis, but almost within that one big crisis, a lot of little crises that keep getting passed on. Certainly the financial crisis that led to the big recession. And then you can see that spread, you know, right across the world, like literally a world recession, which is something we haven't seen since, you know, the 1930s. And then, you know, and then more sustainability issues like in the United States and the UK. And so, and then now, actually, what you're seeing, like what's being highlighted by the World Bank and the IMF is that kind of weakness is now showing up in these bigger emerging economies like India and China, not growing quite as fast, still growing astronomically compared to our numbers, but they're slowing down. They're dealing with some, you know, some bottlenecks. Um, so again, this weak growth will keep, you know, keep a lid on the you know, and progress in, dealing, in terms of dealing with their unemployment rate over the next few years, and that's going to be frustrating. And that, you know, that's always a very important issue uh, for, for our parliamentarians, you know, the number one issue to kind of promote good employment. So again, back just to the fiscal choice that the government looked at, getting back to balance, you know, in 2015, what does it mean? You know, basically, like for an economist, like for us, when we look at the numbers, like the government is in the position of austerity right now. They actually put the brakes on federally. So we had a big stimulus package in 2009 and 10. You saw all those Canada action plan signs. You know, a lot of work done on, on bridges and roads that stimulated growth. And that lasted for 2009 and 10. That was like almost $50 billion. And again, yeah, that's like a $1.6 trillion economy. That's a lot of stimulus. So that's like for you and I pulling out a credit card and just and spending. Getting this, you know, maybe getting work done around the house, what have you, that provides a nice little boost to the economy. But then in 2012, the government said, no, we have to put the brakes on, you know, we have a problem now. You know, we were telling the, you know, the prime minister and the finance minister, you have a bit of a structural deficit here that you created when you cut that extra point in GST. And so they, you know, they said, no, no, we don't have a structural deficit, but then they behaved like they did. They said, no, we have to start cutting spending now. We're going to freeze spending in departments. And uh, so they put the brakes on. So when you put the brakes on like that, that has an impact on the economy. Just the stimulus, when the government had stimulus uh, in 2009 and 10, they came out with a budget and said, you know, if we spend 47 or $50 billion federally in the province to spend an extra 10 or 50, we'll create, we'll create output, more output, we'll create more jobs. And the same, the same thing happens with austerity. If the government says, now we're going to pull back, and particularly pull back when the economy is weak, then that has an impact on output. So we'll lose, we'll probably lose a percentage point of GDP. We'll lose, you know, you know maybe 150 to 200,000 jobs because of that, you know, sort of pulling back through that austerity. And that's a conscious choice. And uh, that the government has a hard time, um, you know, talking about this sort of trade-off. But for me, I just think it is a trade-off. And it could be a positive or negative trade-off depending on how you look at it. The good thing, though, is if we achieve it, and I say if we achieve getting back to balance, so whoever takes over in 2015 is going to have a good set of books. They're going to have some room to maneuver. You know, we, that structural deficit that they created, that'll be eliminated. 
they'll be in kind of what we call structural balance, meaning the economy's back at potential, we're back in balance. And, you know, that's for the most part a good thing. Again, the problems are still dealing with a, you know, a fairly significant issue and they're going to have to deal with healthcare as we look to the long term. So again, just in terms of that broader context, so we have this uncertainty. But even with sluggish growth, Canada's in pretty good shape. We have these deficits, one and a half, two percentage points of GDP federally, pretty much matched at the provincial level. Like our debt to GDP ratio, it's probably, you know, federally, it's in, you know, relative to the size economy, it's about 33, 34%. You know, and back in the mid-1990s, just to give you a reference point, it was like 66%. You know, and I think when, when, when Finance Minister, Mr. Martin, took over in the mid-1990s, like for, every, for every dollar he was taking in a budgetary revenues, he was spending about 36, 37 cents on debt interest charges, like that credit card debt. When Minister Flaherty took over in 2006, he was spending about 13 cents on every revenue dollar. So that matters. That's all room to maneuver. If you're a finance minister, and Mr. Goodell knows this better than anybody, you know, and you know, if you're paying upwards of 30, 40 cents on every revenue dollar that's coming in on debt interest, you don't have any room to maneuver. At 13 cents, you could look, as I say, like a rock star. You know, you have all that room to maneuver to look at new programs uh, that, that can help you know, Canadians in, in all different kinds of circumstances. So room to maneuver is very important. Okay, now, the, the reason why I came here, talk a little bit about institutions and some of the challenges. And again, as I said, I think the challenge is to restore functionality to Parliament, to restore trust. And I think the challenge is also is to tell, is for us to kind of remind ourselves why these institutions matter. And I think the challenge is our indifference and our, what I would call our willful and you know, blindness to all these issues. You know, Alan Scheck, this professor at the University of Maryland, he said that like, budgeting is really about three things. He says, number one, it's, you know, we know this from just you know, being, you know, managing our, our, our budgets in our houses. It's about you know, living within constraints, you know, with reasonable constraints, you know, often presented in terms of fiscal balance you know, in, in a federal government context. But it's also about how you allocate your money. And it's also about whether you spend that money efficiently. Again, I hate to use that word lean kind of context. I'm not sure I'm a big fan of lean. But that kind of the context of you know, are you spending money efficiently? Like in the case of the federal government, like are you running these big programs, you know, supporting potentially farmers? Are you running, you know, can you like what does it cost you to to, to, to process a stabilization check or a crop, crop insurance check? Is it an efficient kind of process? Or the same thing for an elderly person? Like what is it, are you efficient? And again the allocation. I was mind, just a, you know, a week ago, I had just you know, I was exchanging emails with, um, with former Prime Minister Joe Clark. He's, I think he's releasing a book this this um, this fall, and he said, "Kevin, you got to help me out on this. I need some information. Like, what have we spent over the last ten years on security? What's happened to security spending in this country? What have we spent on diplomacy and development? Can you give me some numbers? You know, when you put those numbers together, it's a very good question. It deals with allocation. Like, we spent four times as much in terms of growth on security, you know, than we did you know, in terms of increased spending on development and diplomacy." So again, what does that mean? So I think that like, you know you want parliamentarians when they come to Ottawa to talk about balance. You do a, not a bad job in balance, but you also want to have really rich conversations. Are we spending the money the way we want to spend it? Your money, taxpayer money. Are we doing it efficiently? And again, we do fine on the on the overall balance issue for the since you know the mid 1990s. But we do a lousy job in allocation and efficiency, and in, in terms of explaining it. There's a quote I like from William Gladstone, former exchequer and prime minister of the UK in the late 1800s. He said, if the House of Commons, by any possibility, loses the power of the purse, again, that power of the purse concept, it's actually written in our constitution, of the grants of public money, depend on it, your very liberty will be worth very little by comparison. That whole issue of accountability, very, very noble. We send MPs you know, you know, from all across the country to Ottawa, to basically keep the government in check, provide that check, you know, that you know, that check on the federal government power. Very noble job. Like, let the prime minister do his job. Let the cabinet do its job. Let them propose budgets. You know, let's see the priorities and the speech on the throne. Let them put legislation in the parliament. But then give the, give our members of parliament across the country what they need to hold the executive into account to make sure that we have not just good fiscal balance, but good allocation of money good efficient money, good policies for Canadians now and to the future. So again, that power of the purse, written right into our Constitution in the Financial Administration Act, 
It doesn't rest with the Prime Minister. It rests with the individual MP. Very nice piece by Andrew Coyne in, in a, the Walrus Magazine recent edition about how to restore, you know, uh, you know, in Parliament, how to restore the strength of an in individual MP. He basically makes the claim like you need to stand up for your own rights, individual MPs. They like have far too much party discipline, and, and, and we're going in the wrong direction. So then the question becomes, and this is the question that I faced, and the question that created a lot of stress for me over the last five years as the budget officer, do you want members of Parliament? Do you, you know, before they vote, do you want them to have financial information? Like, why wouldn't you? I just automatically, why does that have to be such a hard thing to achieve? Um, and I can honestly tell you, I mean, again, I'm someone that's been, as, as Tom said, 27 years working at finance, working at the Privy Council office, working at Treasury, I worked at Fisheries and Oceans, worked at Agriculture. Very rarely, you know, the Prime Minister gets great information. The Finance Minister gets great information. Cabinet, for the most part, gets great information. But Parliament, if you do that job of holding the government to account, never, never see it. Never got what they really needed. We give them lots of stuff. We could, you know, give them paper and paper and paper. And but it, was, it was not the stuff that they could truly hold the public service and the executive to account. Almost never happened. And I can go through the files. This was why we were asked to cost the war in Afghanistan by Mr. Paul Dewar. It was why you know, when we costed fighter planes. I think, I'm sure, parliamentarians never saw that kind of analysis. We would give that analysis to the Prime Minister, we would give it to the Finance Minister, Minister of National Defense would never, you know, never, Parliament would never see it. When we costed crime bills, same thing. Parliament never got any that information. Yet they were asked to vote on legislation. You know, when the Prime Minister said, old age security, got to change it, it's not sustainable, we're saying, well, we've done analysis on it. We're the only ones that have done it now. It is sustainable. You can change it. No one's saying you shouldn't change it. Maybe we're spending too, many, too much money now in the future on seniors, but you don't have to change it because it's not sustainable. Change it because we want to give more money to the next generation. I could buy that. But, so they never saw that information. You know, there's a quote I like from uh, our, um, Tony Judd, a kind of a British historian. Um, and he said, he recently passed away, a very prolific man. He said, in the short run, democracies can survive the indifference of the citizens, the so-called democratic, 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 uh, democratic, getting tired, <laughs> democratic deficit. Instead of, you know, the declining turnout, you didn't get a declining turnout in the referendum, that was good, that was amazing, good for Regina. You know, the cynical, but the cynicism, it's amazing how much cynicism we have towards politicians and, um, you know, just our political institutions. Like, we have to deal with that issue. In the short run, Tony just says, you, you, can, you can survive for a period of time. In the long run, he says, democracies, they exist only by the virtue of the engagement of citizens in the management of the public affairs. Like, you have to engage people just the way you engaged them in the referendum yesterday, you know, over the wastewater site. That's a healthy thing. But once you start getting cynical and different, you know, voter turnouts drop down 70, 60, 50 percent, below 50 percent, then we're not engaged anymore. You start reading the newspapers, we don't care, you know, and we get turned off by what's going on in the Senate, and we just say, ah, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. And then when you look at the rest of the world, it doesn't work out that way. Now you look, what's the difference between us and a lot of countries in the Middle East? It's our institutions. You know, a lot of literature coming out now, great literature, you know, some, you know, some literature for some great economists from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, why nations fail. They say three things. Actually, they say for why nations succeed, they are more positive. Number one, economic opportunities. You've got to make sure all the kids like in this room that were studying journalism or economics, studying at the University of Virginia, you've got to give them opportunities. Uh, number two, they say, you know, these folks, Ashton McGill Robinson, who wrote the book Why Nations Fail, you've got to be able to hold the legislature, you've got to be able to hold the executive to account. Very important. You know, number three, that you've got to disperse political power. Number three. You know, so we're really struggling. And I can honestly, it's not hard for me to make the case. The problem is, they don't get that information. They cannot hold the government to account. Like, for me, the case in point, 2012, the government goes from stimulus to austerity. So now they're freezing budgets after they've been growing at about 6% a year for, for over 10 years. And then, you know, the government's, I, you know, the government, we, they released the spring reports. There was no information on a departmental basis on where those cuts were going to take place. And so I started to write to deputies. And over the spring of 2012, we wrote three sets of letters to all the deputies. I need to see your spending plans. 
You know, I need to provide risk analysis to parliamentarians. You know, is there fiscal risk? Will we achieve all these savings? Is there service level risk? I need to do a risk assessment on the priority budget officer. They said, no, we can't give that to you. And how could you have any accountability when you have, you don't have departmental spending plans consistent with the budget? Again, the budget's a high level plan. You know, Minister Goodell had written many budgets. The d details come out in the departments, and the government said, no, we're not giving you the details. And I said, well, you gave us the details and stimulus. Oh, yeah, but that was different. That was a minority parliament, and we were spending money. Now we're taking money away. So then I had two rounds of letters with the clerk of the Privy Council. I even met him. He said, no, you're not getting it. Then cabinet minister said, no, you're not getting it. You're exceeding your mandate. You shouldn't even be asking that question. How could you be the priority budget officer and say, we're not going to look at austerity when you focused on stimulus? And he said, no, you're not getting it. I said, well, we, we have, the system's completely broken. There is no accountability. They're saying, you know, we, just, there's nothing to hold them accountable to. There's no plan. And, you know, I think Canadians should know. Like, what's the impact on the food inspection agency? What's the impact on human resources or service Canada? You know, what is the impact? How are they going to manage? How are they going to freeze spending levels for five years? How are they going to maintain those service levels? No, I can't tell you. I won't tell you. So we went to federal court. And it was okay. It was a process. You know, we had, um, at the end of it, actually, we got the decision. It was the last two days in my office. We were in federal court. And then we got the decision afterwards. And the judge effectively said, you know what? You created the priority budget officer. You told me to do this stuff. And, um, you know, I'm going to ask the priority budget officer to go back, you know, to parliamentarians and ask him one more, to the, to the executive, ask him for that information one more time. But if he comes back to me, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to provide judgment on whether he should be getting it or not. Very effectively insinuating that he would stand up to the Act of Parliament. Because the, the government created this, you know, Parliament created the Act of Parliament. Actually, they created sort of the Parliamentary Budget Officer, which is, is mandated is in the Act of Parliament. Just a few words about the estimates process. Like, so we have this process, that's where we scrutinize those departmental spending plans. That's effectively where the government says, no, we're not giving them to you under, under austerity. We gave, you know, we gave them to you for stimulus, but not austerity. So basically, again, we spend roughly $240, $250 billion a year of spending. You know, we have like 20 big departments and a whole bunch of agencies. It's like 90 plus organizations. You know, and you know, they do, there's thousands of programs. And literally, if you want to break them all down, they got approved by finance ministers and and the Prime Ministers and Parliaments over many years. So we asked Parliament to scrutinize them, create standing committees, and we have these supply periods, and we said, go away, start examining, ask the tough questions. And, uh, but you know, effectively, we give them no scope, effectively, to make changes. So like, when you're basically told, you examine, but you know, you can't actually, you can't change anything in the current system, because it would be a, actually like, a, it would be a vote of confidence, a financial bill, so they can't actually do any change. Like, we know ourselves, if somebody told us, like, you know, I'm really interested in your opinion, but I'm not really going to do anything with it. Like, there's a problem, right? Like, there's an incentive in the system. You have to give these people the ability to make changes in that system. Number two, like, that process, the way they vote, you know, you know again, on 240 250 billion dollars a year, you know, like a quarter of a trillion dollars in all these departments, they vote basically on, on what we call them input. So they get a big department, say, Aboriginal and Northern Affairs. And they'll vote on the operations for that whole department. They'll vote on um, they'll vote on capital for that whole department. They don't vote on education. They don't vote on water. They don't vote on development. They don't vote on land claims. But they have to vote right across the department. These, you know, these, and they don't understand it. And you cannot actually walk the numbers through from the budget, you know, to that department. You know, those programs that are in the department to the public accounts. It's just you know, I've been there in those departments. You have to be more than an astrophysicist. Um, there's only a handful of people that can really do it, and you kind of lose confidence in the system. And even if you're there for decades, you have a hard time walking through the numbers. You know, money's you know they don't get they don't show up in the in the estimates because you know the budget's done on an accrual basis, the estimates are done on, on uh, a cash basis, um, and uh, you know there's some stuff that doesn't show up in the estimates. It's you know it's held back under special allotments. You know, you have special votes that you have the Treasury Board. You cannot go from, you, know, you just cannot go, you, know, you cannot walk through. And lastly, on the estimate system, it's not a level playing field, which is really the way that we set up Parliament for checks and balances, to power the purse resting with the members of Parliament. They should have needing to have that information. So again, we set up the system so that it favors the Prime Minister. It favors the Executive. 
So that like, all the power rests within the power of the purse, even though in the Constitution, the Financial Administration Act is supposed to rest with members of Parliament. We give it effectively, we change the system, we got into the system because we made it so complicated, and all the support goes to the Prime Minister, all the support goes to the Cabinet. And so they, and they, they decide whether they give information or not. You know, the public servants are not so keen in making, providing information. You know, I'm a public servant. And, you know, we're not so keen in saying, well, you know, because if I provide all this information, say we're cutting something that's difficult, my phone rings. The media is asking questions. You know, my boss is getting emails. I have to answer those emails. I have to go in front of committees and explain why we're doing, why we're cutting here and not there, or why there's a problem with that program. So they stop providing this sort of information. You know, and so the public service is just as much at fault, like myself, as, as anybody when we design the system. You could simplify this thing so easily. If we could easily go in and create a process that incense problems to make the changes. We could change the structure of the public accounts so we vote on program activities. That big issue a few years ago when people found out that, well, we're moving money from border infrastructure funds to uh, legacy funds around Muskoka. Well, like, you know, who, is that possible? Yeah, it's actually possible because it's all done within the same vote. Make them vote on program activities. So vote on farm financial bills. You know, vote on, on, on ice breaking. You know, vote on, uh, you know, old age security programs. Vote on Aboriginal health and water programs, you know, you know, health and water programs, et cetera, et cetera. And then keep, and have the, so when we come back, if the, if the, you know, if the cabinet minister or deputy minister wants to change the needs a lot, they have to go back to parliament. And you have real accountability. And then lastly, make part of, make all public servants accountable. They make us release our work. Again, I'm, you know, in my office at the PBO, we released everything we did. Everything. We wouldn't do anything confidential. We actually had to fight for that. So everything you did is on our website. It's still on our website, even though I haven't been there in six months. You can see all the studies right back from our very first study where we cost of the Afghanistan engagement. And up to our, you know, up to the product that got released today, it's all there. All our correspondence with deputy ministers, we need this information, here's why we need it, and their responses back, it's all there. All our, you know, quarterly hospitality, there's almost none because I'm the cheapest guy you've ever met. And uh, it's all there, even those expenditures are on our website. Not hard to do, easy to do. Just show your work. So why wouldn't we ask, why wouldn't we ask public servants, when I, and I was a public servant for 27 years, what are your assumptions behind your forecast? How did you estimate that, you know, the, you know that, the impacts of that tax expenditure? You know, what did the cost if you change the GST by a percentage point? You know, what is the cost of a universal child care program? Show us your analysis. There's nothing, there's no cabinet confidence there. It's just adding and subtracting numbers and a lot of assumptions. You know, in some parts, like in some parts of the world like New Zealand, that's proactively released. They don't have a choice. They, they, you know, you, they have to release it. And I think so, you know, again, so the future, if you want to look at it, other countries do it way better than we do. We can just copy from some of these other countries. So we can clean up that estimate system. You know, again, is there any chance in the world that we're going to, in this speech from the throne this fall, that we're going to have a major priority from, from the prime ministers to change the estimate system? No. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say zero, but it's very small. They won't change it. Why won't they change it? It doesn't serve that. It would serve Parliament, it would serve Canadians, but it doesn't serve their interests. Very hard thing to do. Getting back to that quote about, it's hard to get people to change things that their salary depends on. Just a few words about the Parliamentary Budget Office. And like, to me, it was an, you know, an experiment in fiscal transparency. It was, you know, again, it was a job that nobody really wanted to be the Parliamentary Budget Office, including me. And everybody had their head down when they were asking. <laughs> and because, um, you know, you know yeah, the coffee shops just like, well, governments, they don't want more accountability. So why would you take the job? And the way the legislation was drafted, you know, this person, this Parliamentary Budget Officer, and it's still the case, works at pleasure of the Prime Minister. And is it the job of the Parliamentary Budget Officer to provide pleasure to the Prime Minister? By pleasure means they can remove you at any time. You have one nasty report, you're gone. So what's the incentive to provide a report saying, you know, I'm really worried about fighter plans. I think, you, you know, I think we underestimated like big time. I'm really worried about crime bills. I think they're going to build up. You know what? You never told the provinces they're going to have to pay even more than you guys. And, you know, so what's the incentive when you work at pleasure? There is no incentive. There's no protection in that system. And then they put the office in the Library of Parliament. Very nice institution. But a very different business model. You know, it's, just, it's, a, very, it's a confidential business service to members of the Parliament to help them 
get ready for the discussions at committee to write committee reports, very important. But it's not a legislative budget office. You know, a legislative budget office would be like the meetings Minister Goodhead would have to have with other cabinet ministers. I'm sorry you're not getting this. You didn't do your homework. That's more than nature. That's more of a body contact sport. And so it's a very different, it's not a congruent kind of business model in that sense when money is involved. So, and the other thing is the issue of transparency. Like, you know, in, you know, it's like an OECD best practice principle for legislative budget. Office. You've got to publish everything you do. But that's what keeps you honest. That's what keeps you saying, well, you're a partisan. You know, Paige, you're a liberal hack, you're an NDP hack, you're a Green Party hack. The only way you can fight that is, well, look at my work. Look at our work. It's all up on our website. Where did we talk about this was, you know, your priorities for the country or your policy direction? We didn't say buy F-35. We didn't say change old age security. We didn't, no, it just said if you change it, here's a cost. Actually, here's a range of costs because we really can't predict the future. Nobody can predict the future. Um, so, like, they set up, the, the, to me, they set up the, the legislation to fail. They didn't want it, you know, at that point in time. And I told the kids today, or the kids, sorry, I apologize. I told the students today, this is my age. I told the students that, you know, the story that I heard from Mrs. Rivlin, who set up the Congreg Congressional Budget Office in the United States in the 70s, and she met Mrs. Thatcher. And she asked, you know, Mrs. Thatcher said to Mrs. Rivlin, Mrs. Rivlin, I'd love to have one of these, you know, legislative budget offices. She was in opposition at the time. And then a few years passes by, and then, you know, some, somewhere in the early 1980s, Mrs. Rivlin meets his Mrs. Thatcher, and Mrs. Rivlin asks, like, are you going to build the budget office? She says, well, why would I do that? Like, they have the power now. Like, why would I want to, you know, provide all this, you know, have this transparency, have these data points where I have to debate? It's, it's a nuisance for me to get to where I want to get to. So for us, it was like, we're an experiment. We decided really early on, if we're going to do this, we just decided, you know what, we're going to be like a 21st century organization. We literally, over coffee, we decided in the summer of 2008, hadn't released a report, we decided, you know, we're going to be just an open model. We'll publish everything we do. We'll put it on a website. We decided, you know, all our major costings would be peer-reviewed. Otherwise, we, you know, the parliamentarians wouldn't think that work was authoritative. So we get people, before we released it, to be experts in the field to look over our work. And we decided, you know, we never had a big budget. So we said, you know, we'll just we'll work and we'll be a very open or we'll, we'll be a very open organization. We'll go to the expertise. We didn't know anything about fighter planes. We didn't know where to do fighter planes at the time. So we'll just go find people that know something about fighter planes. You know, on the same thing on, on crime bills. Um, you know, we'll just go find the experts and then we'll sit down with them and we'll bring our toolbox of financial skills and we'll meet, sit down with these people and we'll work out some numbers and then we'll you know, <laughs> write a paper, not a PowerPoint presentation, but a paper with, you know, with, uh, details, and we'll put our names on it. We'll put our names on it. Like authors will put their names on the paper. You know what? And then I work at pleasure. Everybody can hold me accountable. I've just given that responsibility under the Act of Parliament to be the budget officer. You know, if I make a bad mistake, hold me accountable. The work is all there. It's all on the website. We'll put it up. Everybody gets to see it at the same time. We do nothing that's confidential. So we started that way, and we kept it that way, and it wasn't easy. Like, we had major pushback for sure. But in some ways, I look back, that was just healthy. Like, it's part of the change process. Change is never easy. And if, you, you know, if we're going to push through it and start pushing more transparency, that's the way you have, somebody has to start, even if this, the process sputters and we fail. I think a former boss of mine, my, Alex Himmelfarb, said to me, he was a clerk of the Privy Council, he said, Kevin, there's no risk for your risk. Like, you cannot pretend like, OK, we're going to do something, and then there's no risk. You can't say you're going to start a legislative budget office, you're going to be transparent, guess what, guys, you won't have to worry. Like maybe, you know, we'll all live happily ever after. Um, like we kind of knew after the first few reports it wasn't going to get, it wasn't going to be easy. After our costing of Afghanistan, after our first economic and fiscal projections that were very different from the government, they cut my budget by a third. <laughs> And then, you know, I had to whine about that. You know, I grew up in Thunder Bay. It's not popular to whine. <laughs> it's certainly about money. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't have money. And, you know, it's hard to explain to people. Like, he gave me a deal. He said I had, you know, so much money to, to, to do this, you know, legislative mandate, provide in, in part in the legislation, he says provide analysis on the economy, on the nation's finances, scrutiny the estimates, costing, and they gave me a budget for it. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to work within the budget, and then they took it away. They didn't like the reports. And then in the summer of 2009, I found myself in front of a joint committee, a parliament basically saying I should be held to contempt of parliament. And, for, and I'm saying, well, and I said, like, how did we get so far off track? 
Like all we effectively done at that point in time, released these sorts of costings on the war, economic and fiscal projections that were more accurate than the government. We did some nice work for Aboriginal folks, looking at you know looking at capital budgeting for schools, and our reports. See, these are the best reports in my 30 years, and I'm being fired. And uh, and then I'm saying, like, where's the contempt? Like, and you know, and I, we actually had this issue when we went to federal court. The speakers are saying, you know, she says you're you're certain certain the privileges of parliamentarians. I said, don't we want like in the Constitution, the Financial Administration Act says the power of the purse rests with the House of Commons. Don't we want to give them information? You know, you create change, and then it actually, it was just I found it was just an amazing debate. You know, and then I came back when they released that report. They said everything I had to do with you was confidential. It was a unanimous committee report. Not an easy report. I honestly wanted to quit that day. I, I just thought I had like, no clients, and it was really the people in my office that no, I can't quit. This is like no employer. So they said, no, we have to stick it through. Keep getting products out the door, and you know, and we'll figure out a way how to get around the confidentiality, which we did actually. And, you know, and people helped. You know, the media helped. They were very supportive in the sense that they paid attention. Like a lot of people, when I first took the job, and I said this to the journalism students this morning. A cabinet minister said to me, no one's going to be interested in what you do. No one, maybe three people. And I swear to God, it's a direct quote. I mean, one chief economist, you know, works for the, you know, the Liberal Party. You know, maybe one senator, conservative senator, he likes geeky stuff. Other than that, nobody's going to be interested. And I'm saying to myself, well, after 27 years working at finance, the Privy Council office, costing all these things, how could they not be interested? They've never seen this stuff. You know, not knowing even at that time we would be costing fighter planes and ships and crime bills, et cetera, et cetera. And, but I think actually, so this is really more of the message to the students. Like, actually, you know, the power of the pen is pretty strong. Like, very strong. If you do the analysis, if you do the homework, just like the, the Canadian Center of Policy Education, you put that information together, you put it out, you speak to people, like, you don't hide, you don't dock, you can actually have a pretty significant impact. Now, some people will argue, like, I don't have a job. I was unemployed in April, so maybe it had no impact. And some people said, they, maybe, you know, did you play it wrong? Like, did you come out too strong? Would you have done it differently? Maybe you should have eased in on the whole transparency thing. Yeah, and, you know, again, more advice. Like, to me, back you know, early on, we got advice from, from a fellow from the OECD. He said, Kevin, cement dries quickly. You know, and, you know, maybe from the end of it, I understood that. <laughs> and so like he said, like, if you're going to be like a transparent office, you have to be transparent on your first report. Like if you're going to be an analytical office, you've got to be analytical on your first report. Like, and so like you, 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 there's no, like there's no, you know, if you're going to speak, you know, so-called truthiness, like you can't, it always has to be there. Like you can't say, oh, I'm going to do it now, not, not on this file, but not on that file. So, that became part of a big part of the process. That kind of that consistency cementarized quickly. So, you know, our point of view is that we tried to build a budget office, a great experience. It was an experiment. What happens if you give parliamentarians the information? Well, look at F thirty five. I think it does make an impact. You know, and um, you know, and so we, and we wanted to be there as well on, on the austerity issues, on the old age security issues. I think you can. If you give that information to parliamentarians, it's not the parliamentary budget officer. They can take that information. You know, they can say, you know what? Okay, we just had a war in Afghanistan. We lost, you know, we, we sent tens of billions of dollars of capital. What kind of military do we want after that war? They can debate that now. You know, what, you know we had 25, 30,000 troops, or, you know, individual soldiers go to Afghanistan. What's the cost of death and disability after that? You know, and so that's a significant issue. And then we did like an Aboriginal educational infrastructure. And we basically looked at the model and you know, and we said to ourselves, like, why wouldn't we cost Aboriginal educational infrastructure the same way we do for, for primary schools and secondary schools? Like the schools of my kids, why, why would we do something different for that? And we actually put the same model together, we're underfunding about a hundred million a year for Aboriginal people. Same model. And you know, we did get data from you know from a deputy minister. And um, you know, if the Prime Minister says that old age security is not sustainable because we have increases in, 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 in the number of recipients, and it's going to continue to increase, like, I think he, he should explain to people that, like, you know, what that really means. 
And, you know, because when we did the analysis, like, you know, it's easy to see that the number of recipients has gone up by millions since I joined the public service in 1981. And it will go up in millions over the next few years. It's a program that's funded by general revenues. So actually, when we did the analysis, you know, the actuary does analysis, it is sustainable. It doesn't mean you shouldn't change it, but you can have a debate. So I think on every one of these, on fighter plants, when we costed fighter plants, you know, we would do all the work on the fighter plants. Like, you know, you know, so if you, if, if you tell somebody you can get a fighter plane for 75 million, then yeah, go ahead. You know, that fighter plane, you get a stealth fighter plane, fifth generation, you get it, but you ain't gonna get it for 75 million. If the Americans are already budgeting, you can get much higher numbers than that. And you're not gonna get it cheaper than the Americans, they build them. Why would they sell them to Canadians for less than they're getting? You know, it just, it's, their laws prevent them from doing that. So every one of these issues, Again, and then you can raise the issues like, do we really, like, do we want to spend 30 or 45 billion dollars for a fighter plane over, over a life cycle? You know, do we need a fifth generation stealthy fighter plane? Are we going to be strike fighters? Are we going to be the ones that go in to Syria, you know, in the first wave? Is that, you know, you can have a different conversation. So financial people, even though with, you know, information, they don't set the priorities, they don't set the policy directions, but they can impact the debate. So I think like, the cabinet minister was wrong. So information does matter. And if you give parliamentarians that information, they can make a difference. Thank you very much.